These stories tell the tales of three incredibly sick killers who took forever to finally admit to their horrific crimes. Lee Porter was an adorable little girl from Pueblo, Colorado. She was a jokester and loved to make others laugh. She was particularly close to her older brother, Max, who was her best friend. Unlike in other sibling relationships where an older brother might get annoyed by his younger sister always hanging around, he was happy to spend time with her, and they shared the same group of friends. It only made sense that when Max grew up and went off to college, Lee came along, and they both majored in massage therapy. She did everything that her brother did. Her mother, Renee Jackson, recalled. For a while, things were great, but everything changed when Max graduated and ended up moving to California. Lee had just gone through a breakup and had become incredibly depressed. Her mom, Renee, was very worried and had no idea how to help her daughter. She believed that there was something more going on that Lee wasn't telling her. I'm scared for you. I'm scared that you're going through something that you're not telling me. I don't know how to help you. At one point, Renee became so frustrated over the situation that she did something that would later become her biggest regret. She asked Lee to leave her house. What she didn't know at the time was that this would be the last time she would ever see her daughter. I have a hard time forgiving myself for that. Just as her mother had suspected, there was something more going on with Lee. She had a secret. It was that she had recently begun using an illegal substance, something that she had confided in her older brother Max about. He was horrified when he found out. Yeah, and I freaked out when she told me. Like, why are you doing that to yourself? Lee's life had crashed down around her, and she wanted a fresh start. She thought the best way to get one would be to move to somewhere new. So when a high school friend named Christopher Wadey offered her a place to stay in Denver, she accepted and decided to move. She packed up her car with all of her belongings from her college dorm and left. Max found Lee's decision to move very odd. She wasn't the type to ask people for help and Christopher was a strange person for her to turn to. He realized his sister must be in some serious trouble if she was willing to go to him for help. I knew there was something really bad happening because for her to even ask for help, she must have been having such a hard time. It turned out that Christopher had reached out to Lee several months prior through Facebook. This was evident to her mother, who started noticing that he had been liking and interacting with her posts. Christopher had privately told Lee that he would help her get over her addiction to substance abuse that she was dealing with. But Christopher would not turn out to be the hero he portrayed himself to be. In fact, he was quite the opposite. Max began to suspect that something could be wrong with his sister when she failed to get in contact with him. It was hard for me to get a hold of her. I eventually started feeling there was something wrong when two days went by. Not long after moving to live with Christopher, Lee texted her mother, Renee. And she told me that she loved me and that she hoped that I was doing okay and that she was trying to get her life together. Renee told her that she loved her too, but Lee never responded. It would be the last time Lee would text either her mother or her brother. As time went on, Max was becoming more and more panicked that he couldn't get in touch with his sister. He frantically called her over and over again. Finally, he called his mother and told her that he believed something seriously wrong had happened. He said, Mom, I have been trying to get a hold of Lee. She won't respond. Renee agreed with her son that something suspicious was going on. She ended up calling Christopher and asking him what he knew of her daughter's whereabouts. Strangely, Christopher claimed that Lee had left the same day she arrived at his home. He alleged that late at night, Lee had gotten a message and then suddenly took off with someone in a white truck. Now, very concerned, Renee reported her daughter missing to the Westminster police. When police questioned Christopher, he gave them the same story that he had given Renee. But he also provided more information about what allegedly went on the day that she left. They had gone out to eat and then returned to his apartment where they hung out and talked. Something about Christopher's story just wasn't adding up, with one main reason being that Lee's car was found left behind at Christopher's apartment complex. It was still packed with all of her belongings. Why would she she have left without taking her things with her. The car was looked over for any sign of blood, but nothing turned up. Police then turned to surveillance footage taken at the local Boston market. 
The restaurant Christopher claimed that the two of them visited the day before she left with a stranger. Sure enough, they were both seen at the restaurant that day, confirming that at least that portion of Christopher's story was truthful. Initially, Christopher seemed to be perfectly cooperative. He let police search his apartment, despite the fact that they had no warrant. He also posted missing posters on his Facebook page, begging anyone who knew anything about Lee's whereabouts to come forward. Max knew that Christopher was not the good-hearted person he claimed to be. He had known him back in high school and had heard disturbing rumors about sick fantasies Christopher had that he had written about in a journal. These fantasies involved capturing girls and using them as slaves. In fact, some people had even turned Christopher into school administrators because they were disturbed by the creepy things that he was writing about. The people that went to school with him said that he was creepy. Slowly, the dark history of Christopher began to unravel. Police learned that Christopher had been discharged from the military after a psychiatrist determined that he had mental health problems. He had admitted to the psychiatrist that when he was in high school, he had attempted to kidnap and kill a teenage girl. He claimed that he had gone to the girl's house late at night armed with knives. He snuck into the house and was making his way towards her bedroom when he was spotted by her sister, causing him to run out of the house. When the police searched Christopher's apartment for a second time, they took a look at his iPad. When they looked at his search history, they found that he had been searching violent and disturbing things, some of which were illegal. Things became even more disturbing when they discovered a large duffel bag in Christopher's closet. It contained women's underwear, which he claimed belonged to him. Then there was the blood. Police found it on multiple different surfaces within the apartment, but especially on Christopher's bed. He had tried to wash it out with bleach. While they had suspected that the blood could belong to Lee, they couldn't confirm this without first finding her body. Police thought that they were getting closer to finding Lee when they tracked signals from her phone to the area of a local landfill. With the help of bulldozers, they searched through tons and tons of debris for any sign of Lee. When they didn't find anything, they turned back to Christopher, whom they now considered their main person of interest. They asked him if he thought that there was any way that Lee was in the landfill. Bizarrely, he sighed deeply and admitted that he had been having dreams that Lee would be discovered in a landfill. Officers worked long hours, day after day, searching through the landfill. In time, they did find some signs of Lee. Her wallet, clothing, phone, and even her jewelry, but not her body. When Lee's mom found out about this, she sensed for the first time that her daughter was likely dead. Both Lee's family and the police believed Christopher was behind her death, but they didn't have any way of proving it. Meanwhile, Lee's brother Max decided to try and solve the case on his own. He had been texting with Christopher and acting as if he was his friend. He wanted Christopher to feel as if he could trust him and open up to him. In time, his plan worked and Christopher believed that he was helping Max find Lee. Eventually, Max and Christopher met up together at a local park. They were going to do a tarot card reading in hopes of getting some answers about Lee. What Christopher didn't know was that Max was recording everything secretly on his cell phone. Max is totally convinced at this point that Christopher killed his sister, and eventually he confronts him. At this point, I know he killed her. Max pleaded with Christopher to tell him where Lee was. I know you know. I know you know. I need my sister back, dude. I'm gonna kill myself without my sister. If you did something really, really bad, I will forgive you. I just need to know. Finally, Christopher breaks down. He admitted to killing Lee in alleged self-defense, claiming that she attacked him with a knife when he refused to get her dr Grabbed her, stepped forward and twisted her around so that her body was in between me and the knife. And then I placed my hand at her throat. I didn't start squeezing until after she kept going. I said, we can end this right now. I won't say anything to anyone. Just please drop the knife and you can get dressed. You can leave and go wherever. Then she said that she would stop when either she was dead or if I agreed to buy her She used both of her arms to push against me with the knife, trying to cut my arm to get me to let go so she could keep attacking. So I started on her throat. Christopher went on to say that he was hoping to just get Lee to pass out. 
so he could take the knife away. But this didn't happen and she continued to fight. He squeezed tighter and tighter until she eventually lost consciousness. He also cut her during this process. He dropped her to the ground and checked her pulse. It was then he realized she was dead. Christopher put Lee's body on his bed and used rags to clean up the blood. I did the only thing I could think of and God help me, I put her in the dumpster. Christopher said that he would turn himself into the police, but Max wasn't going to chance his sister's killer getting away. No, you're going to jail right now. You think I'm just going to let you walk away and drive away? You killed my damn sister. He told him that he had recorded the whole conversation. He flew over the table and began attacking Christopher until one of his friends managed to pull him off. He then made Max call 911 and confess himself. While Christopher was being arrested, Max called his mother and hysterically told her that Lee was dead. Christopher was convicted for killing Lee and was given 48 years in prison. Unfortunately, Lee's body was never found. However, today, Lee's loved ones are only able to mourn her death while also knowing that her killer got what he deserved. This is all thanks to Max and his tireless dedication to finding out the truth. Matthew Gibson was born in New York in 1959. He had a rough upbringing filled with abuse. As a result, when he was only a teenager, he began turning to alcohol and other forms of substances as a way of coping. One substance led to another and before long, he was hooked on some very serious and very dangerous and illegal substances. He had two failed marriages as well as two children. However, he was never particularly close to his children and eventually lost track of them entirely. In 2014, Matthew had moved to North Carolina and had finally cleaned up his act. He was sober and found God. His life seemed to be taking a turn for the best. The same year, Matthew began to receive strange texts and voicemails that didn't make sense. In the messages, the caller said that there was a prescription ready at a local Walmart for someone named Nia. Not long after he began receiving these messages, Matthew opened his mailbox one day and discovered an envelope with no return address. Strangely, it contained a flyer for Walmart and nothing else. Matthew had no idea who was messing with him, but became increasingly paranoid and began to suspect that someone was monitoring his phone calls. Matthew had reason to be paranoid. He had a dark secret that he had been holding on to for many years. It was something that happened 17 years ago. He had been living in Arizona at the time. On June 23rd, 1997, Matthew met a woman who he thought he might be romantically interested in. He and the woman went back to his trailer and shared dinner together. The date didn't go well and before long he had determined that she wasn't a right fit for him. He asked her to leave and she grew angry and refused. Matthew completely lost his cool. He grabbed a heavy metal flashlight and used it to beat the woman, killing her. He then put her body in the trunk of his car and dumped her somewhere near the Colorado River. He believed that the woman's name was Anita Townsend. Matthew then promptly moved out of the area and bounced from city to city before settling in Boone, North Carolina. It was there that he found faith and he rebuilt his life. Now that he was receiving these strange messages, Matthew believed that someone had found out his secret and was taunting him on purpose. He grew so paranoid that he decided to get in his car and drive back to the city where he had killed the woman. He wasn't far from the city where everything happened when he decided to check into a hotel, but he was so paranoid he couldn't rest and became convinced that somebody was watching him. The paranoia and guilt that Matthew was experiencing at this time was more than he could bear, and it was eating him alive. He got back into his car and drove all night until he reached a police station in Winslow, Arizona. He walked into the station, broke down in tears, and confessed to what he had done. He explained everything, from how he killed the woman to the weird text messages he received. He was certain that someone knew what he had done. Hello? I committed a murder. Committed a murder? Many years ago, it happened in Bullhead City. I didn't even know who until somebody had been sending me text messages. As he talked to the police, Matthew emotionally explained how paranoid he had become that someone was coming after him. He finally said it's, it's time to put 
put an end to it. The police officer searched through different cold cases that were on file, and sure enough, he found a report that matched the incident that Matthew had described. However, he had been wrong about his victim's name. Her real name was Barbara Brown Agnew, and she was 38 years old when she had been killed. Her body had been found, but police were never able to track down the killer. The police had long since stopped looking into the case, and had he not confessed, Matthew would have very likely been able to go the rest of his life without ever having to pay for what he had done. However, the only reason Matthew ended up coming clean was because he believed someone knew his secret and wanted him dead as a result. Strangely, Matthew didn't recall many details involved with the killing. The police officer thought this was odd, considering most people would remember something as horrific as killing someone vividly. However, because Matthew had been using so heavily at the time, this could play into his lack of memory. The officer looked into more FBI data from around that time and ended up finding out that between 1997 and 1998, there had been three other women that had been killed in the same area as Barbara. Their killers were never found. It was very possible that Matthew was behind these deaths as well and simply did not remember what he had done. Matthew was not charged in connection to these other deaths, but only for the death of Barbara. He was 55 years old when he finally came clean about what he had done and was sentenced to more than 10 years in prison. Matthew's attorney, Ron Gillio, said that he believes it was his client's guilt that sparked his confession. I think because he recently found religion, he was starting to feel guilty and wanted to do the right thing. He is very remorseful and sorry this all happened, he said. Matthew was not angry about his sentence, but rather was ready to pay for what he had done. I had no intention to take a life, but it did happen. And I, as a man, will accept my punishment, Matthew told officers. So what about those weird messages and the mail that Matthew had gotten? Who had sent them? While this was never officially determined, it was likely that they were completely unrelated to what Matthew had done. Some killers will wait until the very last moment to confess their crimes. That was the case of Louise Salazar. Louise preyed upon some of the most vulnerable imaginable, a young mother and her children. The horrific act occurred on October 11, 1997. Martha Sanchez, a 28-year-old mother of three, was asleep in her home in San Antonio, Texas. Martha and her two-year-old daughter were sleeping together in the same bed, while her infant son slept in a crib next to the bed. Her older son was asleep in his own room. At the time, Martha's husband was working the night shift and wasn't home. Louise crept into the house House as the family slept, making his way through an unlocked window. Silently, he walked into the room that Martha was sleeping in and attacked her, attempting to take advantage of her. When Martha woke up and realized what was going on, she began screaming. Her screams woke up her 10-year-old son Eric and he came running. Louise, armed with a knife, stabbed Martha three times in the chest, injuring her badly but not yet killing her. Eric fought for his mother's life and began trying to wrestle the knife away from Louise. He ended up getting stabbed himself himself once while fighting the man who was much bigger than him. His mother urged him to run and get help. Despite the fact that he sustained a lot of blood loss, Eric managed to stagger out of the house and into the street. He began pounding on door after door until at last someone answered. Eric explained what had happened and a neighbor called for help before rushing to the Sanchez home themselves. Just as they got to the house, they saw a man taking off on a bicycle. Inside the home, Martha was discovered lying in her bed. Unfortunately, she had already passed away. Lying next to her was her young daughter, also covered in which at first was believed to be her own. However, it would turn out that the child was lying in her mother's blood and was completely uninjured. Eric was rushed to the hospital and treated for his wound, which he would later recover from. Once recovered, he provided police with useful information. He claimed that he had recognized his mother's attacker as 27-year-old Louise Salazar, their former neighbor. Louise was not new to crime in any shape or form. Eight years prior to this incident, he was convicted of robbing convenience stores. Instead of prison time, he was given probation. Then four years after, he was convicted for attacking an older woman with mental disabilities. For that, he was only given two years probation. So, how did Louise first come into contact with the Sanchez family? Just as Eric had said, he had been their neighbor for three years. He lived next door to them in a house that belonged to his mother-in-law. The Sanchez family had always been kind, helpful neighbors to Louise. In fact, Martha's husband even helped Louise find employment at a local Kmart. 
Despite the kindness that the Sanchez family showed Louise, he was disrespectful back to them and even made passes at Martha, despite her being married. Eventually, Martha's husband had enough and told Louise to never come around his family again. He then moved away from the Sanchez family just weeks before he would take Martha's life. When police investigated the crime scene, they noticed that a phone line had been cut. This was likely done by Louise to prevent anyone within the home from calling 911 during the attack. Luckily, police would not have to search long for Louise as he would turn himself in just hours later. He went to trial in 1998 and testified on behalf of himself. He tried to explain that he had been drinking the night of the attack and engaging in other forms of substance use. He claimed that he had wanted to go back to his mother-in-law's home but mixed up the houses. He said that he believed Martha was an intruder in his own home and that was why he stabbed her. The jury didn't believe any of Louise's story and he was found guilty and sentenced to the death penalty. March 11th of 2009 was the scheduled day that Louise would be executed. Just one hour before he was to die, he decided to come clean. As it turned out, Martha was not the only person he had killed during his lifetime. In 1992, he had killed another woman. That time, it was a female clerk at a convenience store he had been robbing. He did not know her name. Not long after his confession, Louise was taken to the death chamber and executed. After Louise's death, police looked through the files and eventually found a report that matched the story Louise had told. The woman he had killed was Melissa Morales. She was killed on Easter Sunday while working alone. Because Louise had admitted to what he had done at the very last moment, police finally were able to close the case and give Melissa's family some sort of closure.